in review, again, last week's lesson from verses 15 and 16. We're going to read them back to back before we get into the review. Verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the increase of every part, make his increase of the body under the edifying of itself. Now, looking at verse 16, it's talking about how the Christian body is supposed to work, the church body. Every believer throughout the world is part of the Christian body, the church. And um, so, this Paul, Paul gives us insight into how he believes the church ought to be working, talking about us and every other believer on the planet. So, I'm going to borrow some comments from Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown's commentary. And they talk a lot about, a member of the New Testament was written in Greek, and they talk a lot about what these phrases mean in the Greek from which they were translated. Uh, so the, the first part of that, uh, the first part they comment on is fitly joined together. Up there it said, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. That phrase in the Greek means all the parts being in their proper position and a mutual relation. In other words, each part of your human body, if you're healthy, is in there where it belongs, in its appropriate place. And it said it's compacted. And um, that in the Greek means firm consolidation. Every body, every part of the body of Christ fits together. Now, it's put into this firm consolidation by the phrase, by that which every joint supplies. In the Greek... That means by means of every joint of the supply. So, in essence, it's saying that the supply is passing through the joints in the in the Christian body, the church. And uh, I'll mention, get on that in just a moment. And then he goes um, on to say, the joints are the points of union where the supply passes to the different members, furnishing the body with the materials of its growth. Okay, now, before I comment on that, to me that's an important point, but I want to finish JFB's comments here. The phrase effectual working, according to the effectual working of grace in each member. In other words, God's at work in all of us, Um, And then every every believer, in other words, every part uh, in the Greek means each one part or each individual part. Make of increase, the final phrase from verse 16 that he comments on, translate as the Greek is the same as in Ephesians Ephesians 4.15, maketh or carries on the growth of the body. So just to wrap that up, we talked more about it last week. The idea of the body of Christ, every one of us being members. The human body has a myriad of members. I mean, there are so many things running around inside of you, it's amazing. And um, the human body was something God engineered in an amazing way. You know, when he initially engineered it, he engineered it to live forever. But Adam and Eve uh, changed that. When they sinned, God said, you eat of that one tree, you're going to die. Well, they didn't drop dead when they ate of it. But the principle of death entered into them. In other words, for the very first time, Adam and Eve began a process called aging. There would have never been that process had they never disobeyed God. And so because he created them to live forever, 
as you read the book of Genesis, you see in those early times there were people living 700, 800, 900 years. Methuselah is the oldest man uh, in the, whose age is recorded in the Bible. Uh, was there someone older than him? I have no idea. But he's the oldest age, 969 years. There was a riddle, a good one to fool someone with. Who's the oldest man in the Bible, yet he died before his son? You say, that can't happen. Well, it did happen. Methuselah's son was Enoch, and Enoch was translated, never died. He was 365 years, and God took him. So, um, Methuselah Oh, I forget which son now, so I'm not going to go into that. But anyway, 969 years he lived. Then the flood came. He named uh, uh, Enoch. Yeah, he named... No, there's another son in there. I can't. Who? Enoch is What? Yeah, I had her backwards. That's right. Enoch is... Wait, no, Enoch can't be Methuselah. Well, what about the riddle? You said the riddle wrong. A lot of old people died before, before their sons. That, there's nothing impressive about dying before your son when you're old. Yeah, it's starting to look good for me right now. <laughs> uh, I have to figure the riddle. Yeah, Enoch was a prophet. He named his son Methuselah, which means in the Hebrew, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, when he's gone, it will come. And if you take the ages mentioned of each of the individuals in the right order, as I was not doing today, uh, if you take them in the right order, um, the flood came 969 years after Enoch named his son uh, Methuselah. So it was a prophecy that when uh, somewhere in there Methuselah died, um, he could have died the day before the flood. Uh, who knows? Uh, could have been a year before the flood, but the point was, keep your eyes open when he's gone, the deluge is about to come. And um, so my whole point in that was because he had initially created us to live forever by us, I mean the human body and Adam and Eve, it took it a long time. It took a long period of time of it being exposed to imperfection, the imperfection of the world we live in, uh, for the ages to go down. And um, Noah was 500 years old when the flood came. Uh, well, when, he, when he began to build the ark I believe um, and after the flood they weren't living it the long and you look at Abraham when Abraham come along the most in, Moses and Abraham were probably the two most important characters of the Old Testament when Abraham come along he had his first child at 100 his wife was 90 but she had been barren and had already passed through uh, the chain so ages were really significantly going down by Abraham's day. They were living into the hundreds, you know, somewhere between uh, Abraham uh, lived over 150 years. It doesn't tell his exact age when he died. Um, but after the flood, it started uh, getting less and less and less. And then before the Old Testament's old, they were dying quicker than we're dying. And of course, uh, when I was a teenager, the average age of a man to die was 63 and a woman 65. The average age, and the men was higher because it used to be just men that went to war. And um, so a lot of them were getting killed in their 20s, in upper teens. So that brought the, that age down. The last I heard on TV not too long ago, the average age, and they just put men and women together, that people die now, 78. 63 when I was a teenager for a man 78 now so modern medicine as much as they milk the thing and try to get rich off of us they have really added to our life expectancy um, 15 years I'll take it so anyway 
that's um, why they didn't live, uh, I mean, they lived so long back then. But now he's telling the church in verse 16 up there, the way the church grows is you've got to see yourself as something inside the human body. You're inside the spiritual body called the church. And everywhere there's a joint formed, wherever two things touch, the supply, the spiritual supply God is sending to the church passes through the joints. And that's why it's so important to be around God's people all the time. Because it's when you and I are making joints, fellowshipping together, that spiritual growth occurs. And so when you're away from that, you're not growing. But not only that, not only are you not growing when you're away from that, you might be hindering someone else's growth that could grow if they formed a joint with you, so to speak. Not smoked a joint. Formed a joint, all right? So let's go on to this week's lesson. Don't act like a non-believer. So Paul starts verse 17 with, This I say therefore. I was an assistant pastor for seven years in Des Moines in a church. And Pastor Raleigh was a senior pastor. And he always had a phrase that he used. He said, Whenever you see the word therefore in the scripture, see what it's there for. So that's a good instruction. So here, he said, This I say therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Now, he's saying in relationship to what I told you up here, therefore, because of what we just covered, here's what's important for you to do. Don't walk like other Gentiles, or let me read you a modern translation. Easy to read version, very good translation. With the Lord's authority, let me say this. Live no longer as the ungodly do, for they are hopelessly confused. So, in the King James, it's saying don't walk as the other Gentiles. The other Gentiles, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He carried the gospel to the Gentiles. But now he's writing this letter to Christian Gentiles. And he's telling them, don't live like the other Gentiles, the ones who aren't Christians. Don't live like the unsaved, and uh, is, is what this verse is telling us. So, Paul told us that Jesus had given to us, and I'm not going to take a lot of time, we went through that in the last couple of weeks, but God has given us various ministries. Um, each one of the triune Godhead has given specific gifts to folk. Jesus gave what's called the ministerial gift. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And obviously he gave those to Christians. Jesus isn't wanting sinners to preach the gospel. Uh, he picks people from outside, uh, out, out from the Christian community and calls them to preach. And these are gifts that Jesus gave, and it tells us in Ephesians 4 that the reason he gave them, uh, he started that this chapter off by saying we got to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. It takes endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Human nature, we want to argue with each other. So he says, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, and, and then he gets down to where he says, and several verses later, after talking about the ministry that God has given, apostles, prophets, so forth, he said they will be there until we all come to the unity of the faith. So the whole idea in those first um, 17 verses uh, of this chapter was, you know, there's a lot of churches in town we don't all preach the same thing. There are churches that preach you've got to be water baptized before you're actually saved. Um, I don't believe that. There are churches who believe that... Um, you got to be, not just say a sinner's prayer, but you got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and talk in tongues before you're saved. Uh, we don't believe that here. We believe you're saved by putting your faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing. Plus nothing. Can't earn my salvation. I'm not saved because I live better than my neighbor. Or I lived better than my neighbor before I was saved. That's not why I'm saved. 
I was saved when I was hopelessly lost, according to Romans 5. Hopelessly lost. Couldn't do, I was without strength in the King James. I couldn't do anything to save myself. When I got saved, I became a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Ephesians 2.10 tells me that when he made this new creature out of me, he created me, or reprogrammed me, if you please, unto good works. So Christians do good things, but they don't do good things to get saved. They do good things because they are saved. And that's an important distinction. There's not one good work we've ever done that has anything to do with our going to heaven. Not one. I'm going to heaven because of, of the good work Jesus did. And I put my faith in Him. But, because I'm not saved by works, doesn't mean as a Christian I shouldn't be doing good stuff. God reprograms us in the new birth onto good works. We ought to be living differently than we lived before we got saved. Is Paul's point there. So, Let's move down uh, to uh, verse 18 while he's telling us not to live like uh, on the ungodly or the, peop- the folk who aren't Christians. Why, uh, when he said that the, um, the Gentiles are walking in the vanity of their mind in the King James Version, uh, that they are hopelessly confused in the easy-to-read version, here's why. Having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So he's saying the reason you ought not to live like them is they don't have a relationship with God. Fair and simple. So they're not living the way God wants them to. And what we see sometimes in our own, uh, some of our own loved ones who aren't serving the Lord or whatever, we see that they have a confusion in how they think. They buy in to the philosophy of what Paul called in the King James the other Gentiles, what uh, the the real version calls um, the ungodly. They buy into the philosophy of the world. For goodness sake, they're hearing it everywhere. They're hearing the philosophy of the world everywhere. In schools, colleges when they're young in schools and uh, they're getting if you pardon the expression brainwashed at a very young age and right now parents are standing up across America and said we don't want you teaching our kids that and the government threatened threatening to call them terrorists and set the M- uh, FBI on them. so if a person stands up and said, that's my child, you're not going to teach him that. Um, Not threatening to shoot the guy or anything, or the woman, just saying, I won't stand for you teaching my child that. Uh, And they said, we'll teach him what we want. So, my point is, everywhere you look, TV, movies, radio, wherever you look, you're hearing things that the unsaved are doing that they think is totally proper. And you could get canceled if you don't agree with them. And the good news of the gospel is the only person who can cancel me is God and he's invested his son's blood in me and he's not going to do it. Now I might be canceled the way we look at it in the American society today. But we got to stand up and I heard somebody on TV saying more and more parents are going to have to grab the kids out of the public schools and homeschool. They're going to have to do something to turn this brainwashing around. The teachers doing it don't think they're brainwashing. Most of them are honestly sincere. They think they're teaching them what they need to hear. Why? Because of the vanity of their minds, Paul says. If you don't get your mind in line with God... Uh, it's going to think on vain things that you, you're going to consider perfectly normal. So it's not that they're inerrant, w- inerrantly wicked. It's that they're deceived. And uh, they don't want us messing with them. They want this indoctrination, what we call indoctrination, what they call teaching, 
to go forward. So Paul's saying we can't walk like they do because they're not walking the way the Bible teaches us to walk. All right. Uh, Verse 18 again. Who being past filling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work on queenness and greediness. Or the easy to read version of verse 19 says they don't care any more about right and wrong and they have given themselves over to immoral ways. Their lives are filled with all kinds of impurity and greed. That's what Paul wrote 2,000 years ago about unbelievers in his day. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, Now, there's a lot of people pushing these things that are innocent. They're deceived themselves. They think they're doing the right thing. But there are people pulling the strings above them that know good and well it's just all a scheme to get everyone thinking the way they want them to think and um, so they're uh, they're not innocent they don't believe what they are pushing Uh, they just want power you know I've never had a drink of alcohol ever and I never would because I've seen compulsive tendencies in my life. So, Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but I'll be brought under the bondage of nothing. So, if you understand in your nature that you can get hooked on something, stay away from stuff that can hook you. I've never tried any kind of narcotics. Uh, I did smoke once for about two weeks when I was 15. I had about a two-week smoking career in my life. But uh, outside, I, my mom caught my brother doing it, who was older than me, and made him eat half a cigarette. I was sure he was going to wrap me out, and I was going to eat, eat the other half. And uh, didn't cure my brother. He smokes to this day. It cured me. I had visions of chewing on a cigarette, and I've never touched another one. But my point is, uh, we have to understand certain things. There are people, uh, power is just as, uh, it, it's, a, it's a narcotic of another sort. The more power we give our politicians, the more they want. And they can never be satisfied, and that's where we're at. All right, verse 20 on the back side. You haven't learned Christ that way. He said, but, but you have not so learned Christ the way that the world lives, And that's not what you know about Christ. If so be that they have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. If so be that you, rather, have heard him. So he said, if you've been taught proper Christian doctrine, you understand that other stuff isn't proper or Christian. It doesn't matter how many things... It used to be... I I grew up... uh, you know, they say, I believe in a young universe created by God, but uh, even some Christians believe in a, a universe 12 plus billion years old, and they believe that man evolved about 50,000 years ago. The trouble with that, at the way the population grows, if man started 50,000 years ago, there would be no place to put anybody on the planet now. But nonetheless, I believe in a young universe, no big thing. Um, But I believe everything was created. And um, I think the two biggest lies until now, they're even bigger now. Two biggest lies when I was growing up was uh, evolution. And um, I had another one, I can't even think of what it is now. Um, But evolution tells you, you just evolved. God didn't make you. And if God didn't make you, then you owe nothing to God. You're just another animal. Mankind just developed a little better working brain. That's all. That was chance. Had nothing to do with design. And so, in the Bible, God teaches, in the beginning created he man. No, God created man. In the beginning, God created man and woman are and then the the phrase man and woman created he them in other words in God's reality which is a reality I want to be in touch with 
there are two genres. That's why I'm using it wrong again? Or is that the right one? i got to look up genre because I don't agree with them over here. But there are two sexes, all right? Male and female. That's what God created. And um, so, as a Christian, what this passage is telling me, i got to decide who do I believe. Do I believe modern day man or do I believe God? And uh, I put my faith in the Lord. So I haven't learned when I said you have not so learned Christ. When I come to Jesus as a uh, as a believer and uh, began to learn as I went to church as a teenager and I began to learn the truth of the gospel and as I've studied so many years as a preacher and you learn more and more and more, uh, you understand that the truth of the gospel does not allow what's going on. And let me throw this in there. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, and um, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. But I want you to see something. Paul said the only way to get saved is to hear the gospel, put your faith in Christ. The gospel message is the only message on this planet that can get you to heaven. It's the power of God unto salvation. And then verse 17, he tells us why we need it. Because it's in the gospel that we learn not only how to get saved, but how to walk the Christian life. And then he tells us why it's necessary. Verses 18 and 32 to the end of the chapter, he gives this big list of horrible things people create. Our people uh, commit. And he said, that's why we need saved. And you know what? Before we got saved, we were doing some of that stuff. Now, we're not perfect. We might slip up and do some of that stuff now. But we mourn before God when we do that. I can't stand it when I offend God. Now, God's not like me or you when we get offended. He doesn't want to talk to us. God has showed us over and over in His Word. He's always standing there. Come here. Don't run from me. That's what Adam and Eve did. Come here. He's always calling us close to him. But I'm going to tell you, you read that list, Romans 1, verses 18 to 32, and that's Paul's reasoning why people got to hear the gospel. Because when they're not overcome by the gospel, they're overcome by those things. Verses 18 to 32. All right. Verse 22, after he said that if you've been taught uh, the truth in Jesus, in verse 21, he said in verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful life of lust, rather. Easy to read version again. Throw off your old uh, nature and your former way of life, which is rotten through and through, full of lust and deception. Uh, in the King James Version, that most people have a King James Bible at home, uh, the word conversation doesn't mean what you and I might do after church. We might verbally talk to one another, and we call that conversation. But that's not what the word means here. In the Greek, that word means the, the way you live. What is your life saying to people? Not what are your words saying to people. What is the way you live saying to people? So he's telling us our manner of living here in the King James when he said um, that we need to put off, do away with the old way we used to live. And how do we do that? Verse 23 tells us, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, which he enlarges more on in Romans 12, 2, Paul does. Be not conformed to this world. How do I stop being conformed to the world? But be you transformed by the... Re Knowing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The only way, even as a Christian, that I won't live like the ungodly live is to keep my mind in this book. i got to keep learning. I have to keep learning the truth of God. Because Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Every area of your life that you've ever experienced a bondage in, or a lack of freedom in, it's because there's a truth you don't know. Jesus said you will know the truth, 
and it will set you free. So whatever you struggle with, there's a truth in this scripture you haven't wrapped your faith around yet. You got the word, the word of Christ. He's guaranteeing to me the truth will set me free. So if I'm not free in an area, I need to dig and dig and dig till I find the truth that I don't know yet. Because that truth makes me free. Jesus guaranteed it. All right, so, uh, verse 24. After telling us to put off the old man, he doesn't want us running around spiritually naked, so he said, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So when you become a, a new creature in Christ, you put your faith in Christ, you're now a Christian, you're, in a, you're a new person. Here's one of those truths that can set you free. we got to believe what Jesus said about us, even when we don't see it. Jesus, uh, Paul wrote in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He didn't write, he is becoming gradually a new creature. He wrote, he is a new creature. He said, old things have passed away. He didn't say the old things are gradually passing away. He didn't say the old thing is all oh, getting a little better and doing a little better here and a little better. He didn't say that. He said, old things have passed away. Let me blow your mind some more. He said, Behold, all things, that means everything, have become new. You say, I'm not living that. You're not living it because you don't believe it. I really push around here. Abraham believed what God said to him about him. And God counted it as righteousness. And then Romans 4 likens what Abraham did to what happens to the believer. The challenge for me is to believe what God said to me about me. And here's what God said to me about me. If any man be in Christ, that's me. I got saved. I'm in Christ. Old things have passed away. That's what he said about me. Behold, all things have become new. I'm going to walk that out in my daily walk in direct proportion to how much I believe it. Period. That's a truth. And if I believe that truth, it's going to impact my daily walk. All right? So, we're to put on the brand new man. Um, in verse 25, he explains some of what that means. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another, talking about the body of Christ, your Christian neighbors. He said, putting aside lying, speak every man the truth to his neighbor. He doesn't mean finger in the face truth. I don't know if any of us in here can take finger in the face truth. Speaking the truth in love, what's compelling you to tell the truth is how much you care about that individual. If you can't speak the truth and love to your fellow Christian, let someone else do it. you got no business doing it. But we are instructed by the Word of God, we got to become, as believers, someone who wants to grow up in Christ. And if I want to grow up in Christ, i got to be willing to hear the truth sometimes. Or I'm lacking. One of the Proverbs was blessing of the words of a friend, the wounds. Oh, precious maybe. It's a blessing or precious, I forget. Are the wounds of a friend. Deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Now what's that mean? Your friend might tell you something that hurts, but it's going to help you in the long run. The wicked will tell you what you want to hear, and it's going to hinder you in the long run. With it are the wounds of a friend, deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. And we need to understand that. We need to um, be friends with one another. Um, so verse 25 tells me, i got to speak the truth to my fellow Christians in love. 
If I can't do it in love, I need to let another Christian do it. But you know what else that tells me? If it's telling me to do that, it's telling my fellow Christians to do it. There'll come a time some Christians got to tell me in love what's what. And I got to be mature enough to receive it. And sometimes we don't receive it right off the bat. We love the pats on the back, you know, but somebody says, you got to change this. We don't want to hear it right off the bat. But then we go our way, grumbling. I thought he was my friend. And you know what happens? If the person was following the teaching of Scripture, if he was honestly telling you because he loves you, you know what happens? When you walk away disgruntled, the Holy Spirit picks up what that man says and starts talking to you. Holy Spirit will say things like, I know that wasn't fun, but he was right, wasn't he? And so a lot of times the reception of the truth spoken in love comes after the fact, as the Holy Spirit starts doing his work. But let me tell you, you speak the truth for any other reason than love, the Holy Spirit's not going to back you up. And that's going to hurt your fellow believer. Not help them. All right. So, here's a good one. Be angry and sin not when not your sun go down upon your wrath. Now, some things you need to understand are hyperboles. It's not saying that a husband and wife can never go to sleep until they make up. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. It's basically saying don't hold a grudge. When Barb and I were young, we had a few fights. We don't fight much uh, anymore. It's either because we're crazy in love with each other or we're just too tired. Maybe a little both. But the bottom line is, there were times we made an agreement. We're not going to make up tonight. We're too mad at each other. Let's roll over and go to sleep. And every time we did that, we woke up the next day, we were mad. But in the heat of the moment. So there are some verses that you have to receive as hyperbole. That means an intended exaggeration to drive home a point. So that um, you need, need to understand, don't take it so literally that you think you got to work out everything before you sleep. Because the more tired you get, the angrier you'll get. So, basically, the lesson there is you're a Christian, don't hold a grudge. That's the lesson. You're a Christian, don't hold a grudge. Verse 27, don't give place to the devil. That's a short verse, isn't it? And a powerful one. Don't let the devil get a foothold there. Verse 28, let him that stole still no more. That's simple enough. And that's acting like the other Gentiles, Paul's telling his... And again, Gentile in the New Testament simply means you're not a Jew. You can be Italian, you can be whatever. Hispanic, black, but you're not a Jew. That's what Gentile means. Uh, so the New Testament divides us, well, pretty much the whole Bible, divides us into two groups of people, Jews and everybody else. And Gentiles is the word uh, representing all the rest of us. Because in the Old Testament, the Jews were in covenant with God. And so it was the Jews and everybody else. And now in the New Testament, Christians are in covenant with God, and it's everybody else. Uh, but there's still Jews. Some Jews are saved, some not, aren't. Uh, some Gentiles are saved, some aren't. But anyway, he tells us, uh, put away lying. Speak, oh, we did that one. Be angry, sin not, don't give place. Let him that stole still no more. You'd think when you're talking to a Christian, you don't have to say that. But but the Holy Spirit said they need to hear it. Let him that stole, quit it. But rather let him labor, or get a job, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give him that need it. So instead, he says, instead of you settling for the person who's in need, work hard so you can help the person in need. We've all had experiences of need where we had to look to someone else, and that's not fun. 
The Bible said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And when we have to hold our hands out, two things. That's humiliating. We don't want to do that, number one. And number two, it's not where the joy of the Lord is. So Paul gets practical. Get a job. Right now there are fewer people unemployed in America than there are jobs that need filled. In other words, it's all kinds of jobs right now. All kinds of jobs. Uh, but the government keeps paying some people more money than they'd make going to work. So they um, don't go to work. They take a cut and pay. Uh, and that's a shame. That's not a good strategy. Um, verse 29, don't use foul or abusive language in the easy to read version. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your uh, words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Verse um, 30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit uh, is the seal of our salvation. We do not want to grieve Him by living badly or talking badly. Get rid of, just practical sense, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of malicious behavior. Verse 32, be kind one to another. Yeah, this stuff is so practical. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. This is one of the most important verses in the Bible to me, verse 32. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Uh, as I close it out with that verse in mind, First John 1 John 1.9 said, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I read that one day and I thought, what? How can justice demand that God forgive me? How can justice demand that God forgive me? I have not in any way indebted God. He doesn't owe me anything. But that verse, the last one I read, explains it. I didn't indebt God. His son did. And it was by eternal design in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had planned this forever backwards. That one day Jesus would go to the cross. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, when he pointed at Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. That one death on a cross could have saved every man, woman, boy, and girl. They turned their hearts over to Jesus. Jesus suffered to pay the penalty of my sin. That's why I am... That's why justice demands that God forgives me when I come to Him through Jesus. Because they've been paid for. But that's why I'm also instructed, since I'm forgiven, I'm to forgive my fellow believers. The forgiven forgive. The graced, those who have received the grace of God, the graced should give grace just makes common sense. And so that's what Paul's telling us today, when not to act like unbelievers.